Hello and welcome to the NIGP webinar, optimizing the three stages of RFP creation for faster results. Today's webinar is being brought to you courtesy of Bonfire. Presenting today is Anthony Berry. For those of you who have attended NIGP webinars in the past, you know that from time to time, we ask someone from outside NIGP to provide their expertise and unique insight into an important issue we wanna to highlight to our audience. Across the years, those experts have represented both the private and public sectors academia and the nonprofit communities. All webinar content is presented strictly for educational purposes only, and is not intended to be an endorsement of our speakers, organization, products, or services. If at any time during the webinar you need tech support, please send me a direct chat. Remember to engage with your peers by making sure you have your chat option selected to everyone. Please submit any questions you have to the Q&A box on your screen, and we will take them at the end of the presentation. Anthony, would you like to get us started? Yeah, sure. Uh, and thanks for the introduction, Justin. I'll actually turn on my video too uh, for anyone who cares to see that it's a it's a real person back here. Um, and hey, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, it's nice to see all the chats pouring in, and nice to see some familiar names as well. Uh, so hi everyone. I'm I'm Anthony. I work at Bonfire. I'm I'm talking to you from Toronto, Canada. So uh, a bit north of the, from some of you folks. Um, but anyway, we can we can go ahead and hop into it here. So. Uh, Again, thanks, Justin, for the introduction. What we'll be going through today is optimizing the three stages of RFP creation for faster results. Um, there's a, a number of ways that we're going to unpack all the information. And just as Ju Justin mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free just to throw them in chat or in the Q&A session. Uh, if you do put them in the Q&A section, that, that makes it easier for us to get to them. Um, but of course, if there's any questions that I see as I you know move through things, I'll I'll do my best to address them. I always like to keep the conversation going as, as much as we possibly can in, in this dynamic anyway. Um, just to run through the agenda for everyone here on the line, we're going to be going through uh, a few different elements just to set the stage and then uh, actually get into the meat of the presentation. So the first thing is we'll, we'll be going through this idea of this three-point collision in public procurement and, and basically what are some market factors that we're seeing that are uh, really impacting the way that procurement uh, is working and some of the challenges that we're seeing all public procurement teams facing, at least to some degree. We're going to be unpacking the 95-5 rule, uh, which is an idea from uh, procurement lawyer Paul Emanuele. Um, and, and we can dive more into that when we actually get to that, that part of the presentation. And then we'll be diving deeper into the specific components of the RFP creation, which is the requirement stage, the research stage, and the build, build stage. And then we'll uh, get into some other outcomes and, and dive into some Q&A. So without further ado, we can go ahead and actually uh, hop into the presentation. Uh, if that's my picture, I'm here on video. So just look at me here smiling if you want to know what I look like. But again, Anthony from Bonfire, thanks, thanks for joining everyone. Okay. So the first idea that we want to talk about, which I think is pretty foundational to why this stuff matters, why teams are looking to be more efficient, why teams are looking to find ways to collaborate better, uh, is because these three key things that we're seeing take place uh, in the market. And for anyone who's attended some of our past webinars, and, and namely uh, the four foundations of streamlined and collaborative RFP collaboration, this slide might look a bit familiar to you. And, and also thank you for being such a, a loyal fan of our, of our bonfire webinars here. Um, but anyway, in that webinar, we spent a lot of time digging into these three points that are happening right now in public procurement. Um, and just for a quick recap, uh, we'll go ahead and go through just them uh, briefly here. So there's definitely a lot of shifts that have been happening uh, that they're impacting the way that public procurement teams operate. And I think the, we're going to see these changes continue to have a bit of an echo effect uh, over the next few years. Um, of course, one of the biggest things that we're seeing is this increase in the funds that the government has been injecting uh, into government. Uh, two big ones, of course, are ARPA and IIJA. Uh, which are injecting billions of dollars into the economy to build roads, bridges, water infrastructure, uh, you know, you, you name it. Um, there's just a surplus or not a surplus, but more funds are being injected into government than uh, really what we've historically ever seen. Um, these infrastructure funds are going to be dispersed to state and local government through existing grants and funding mechanisms, as, as well as potentially new grants and funding mechanisms that still need to be created. Um, and, you know, we're, we're seeing it's going to take about four months to write regulations or, or advertise funding availability for, for some of the new mechanisms that, that are being talked about. Um, but the bottom line here is that over the next few years, 
Uh, we're seeing investment by the government on a scale we've never seen before. Uh, and it's going to allow for a lot of growth, which I think is going to be create an environment that's a pretty stark difference from how things were feeling, you know, two years ago operating in, in the pandemic, where it was more about, uh, you know, being re reactive and addressing immediate need versus now with potential funds, funds flowing in, there's going to be a surplus of a project that's going to be happening. Um, you know, and, and even just from our data, we saw that in 2021, uh, public agencies ramped up their project volume pretty significantly. So there was 39% more RFPs issued in that year uh, comparatively to 2020. Uh, and that, that's just from some, some data that we have from, uh, you know, our, uh, our data department here. As a massive, re or sorry, as, as a result of the massive increase in funding, uh, we're expecting that the average procurement team could see an increase of uh, two to three X the number of projects or RFPs that they'll need uh, to manage today and in the near future. So that's definitely one key element of this. Uh, I think the other dynamic that, that folks are feeling for sure is uh, the stresses around making sure we have the, the people in chairs to do the work that needs to be done. Um, we saw a lot of teams where headcount was cut during economic uncertainty at, at the start of the pandemic and it hasn't really been built back up. Um, and now there's this extra element that we're seeing with uh, generally with the procurement workforce moving more into retirement and also that combined with this, with this great resignation that's happening. Uh, you know, government employment peaked at nearly 20 million workers until the onset of the pandemic, uh, which resulted in, you know, 1.5 million jobs being lost. Uh, there's about 607,000 positions have come back, but state and local government are still 928,000 jobs below um, where they were before the COVID crisis hit. So the phenomena just isn't just restricted to public sector either. Um, you know, we're seeing tons of people leave their jobs. Uh, 4.5 million Americans quit their jobs in November 2021, and you know we're, we're still feeling those effects in terms of the difficult the difficulty that it is to get people again in chairs to, to do the work that needs to happen. So while government employment has endured setbacks during recessions, what's happening now goes uh, beyond that. It has the potential to permanently reshape the future of uh, public sector work. And I think the last thing that we have on here is just, you know, amidst all these other tensions about increased demand or increased work coming in and reduced resources to actually facilitate the work. Um, the other factor is there, there's still a number of teams uh, who are feeling increased stresses and increased pressures on the existing uh, you know, technology environment that they have in place, where a lot of teams are still using patchwork tools or, or patchwork processes, uh, emails, Excel spreadsheets, things of that nature. Uh, so anyway, what you have here is this three-point collision. Um, and these three factors, I think, are going to be defining, are three of the biggest factors in uh, defining what the reality for procurement looks like uh, over the next few years. Um, and the question that a lot of teams are asking is, well, how do we deal with these forces? How, how do we adapt to some of this? Um, in a time when citizens expect more agility in government processes and services, uh, how can you meet that demand, you know, despite strain, headcount, and, and, and resources? Uh, I'm just going through some of the chat here. I have some people who are not seeing any of the new slides. I'm just going to make sure that we're caught up. But the, the thing that we wanted to capture here, I'll actually make sure that we're good on the technical side, and it looks like we are um, with all the slides going, is we, we do have a poll, and, and we're just trying to understand here, as we start to think about and understand, you know, this idea of building an RFP and the importance of that, um, I'm just curious to hear from the folks in the chat, you know, uh, how much time do you typically spend when you are building that RFP uh, from the request comes in to when that actual solicitation is posted. So we have a few options here. Uh, and go ahead and throw in your your vote uh, on the actual poll. And we'll give everybody about five more seconds. And here are results. All right, great. I was just about to comment. I'm glad you like the live poll so much, Amanda. Um, we have a few more for you. So you're in for, for a real whirlwind the rest of this presentation. Um, okay, let's get to the actual poll results. So, uh, of course, the question was, how much time do you typically spend building an RFP? So 13% of the audience said less than two weeks. 
two to four weeks was the most popular option at 47%. Uh, taking longer than that, four to eight weeks was 23%. And then um, more than eight weeks uh, came in at 17%. Um, so the majority of people are taking somewhere between that, you know, let, let's say around a month, month and a half, uh, you know, that, that kind of gets us to, let's say 60% of, of, of the audience here. And I think it goes without saying, right? It's, it's, a, it's a time intensive process. Um, and what we're, as we're gonna go through, it's also a critically important process as well, and a critically important part of the process that determines uh, you know, the success of an RFP. To move us into what we see from our polls, um, the average RFP takes around 123 days to complete. And um, you know, we're pulling that from the data that we have on our side. So there's a variety of variants in the scope of complexity or lack of complexity on some of these projects, but uh, you know, on the tens of thousands of RFPs we see in Bonfire, it typically takes about 123 days to complete those. Um, and what we see is that 20% of that time from the procurement manager is spent on creating the RFP, if not more, before it actually goes out to market. Uh, so specifically the numbers that we have are that, that, again, that 123 to actually complete the event from beginning to end. And we're uh, from what we see, 26 days are spent in the RFP creation process. And I mean, you know, it's, it's a lot of time, right? But imagine how much more effectively you can meet your internal cu customer's request, um, you know, all while getting more time to focus on your strategic and high value task if you could get your RFPs out the door faster. Um, so that's why an efficient and collaborative RFP creation process uh, is really key to faster and smoother RFP cycles that allow you to keep up with changing and, and consistent customer demands without burning out your team. Of course, that's a lot easier said than done. Um, and the reality is in those 26 days that procurement team spending that uh, spent creating that RFP, a lot of that is spent time uh, on, you know, answering stakeholders questions, uh, searching Google for RFP templates, waiting on approvals, you know, procurement isn't necessarily in control uh, through all the stages that happen throughout that process as well. Um, but some of the things that we recommend will allow you to at least get a wrangle on some of the things that you can control and uh, some tips and tricks that can help you suggest move along some of the things that are more outside of procurement's control. Uh, like some of those approvals and, and things like that. So we'll actually get into the, the meat of the presentation here. And that's going to be with Paul Emanuele's uh, 95-5 rule. And if you're not familiar with Paul Emanuele, he's a, he's a lawyer who's dedicated his life to uh, understanding and working with public procurement professionals. Um, so he does a lot of international case study, really. Uh, he's, he's based in Canada, but he works with agencies really all across the world. Um, and he has this principle that estimates that 95% of the problems that procurement faces uh, from a legislative perspective are caused by issues uh, that come from the five core design elements of project planning. And as you can see on the slide here, th those five project components are one, uh, scoping of requirements. So what is it that we're actually buying? Two, what is the pricing structure of the format? You know, how are we looking to buy that? And are we setting up a vehicle to receive pricing in a consistent way where we can try to, as much as we possibly can, get an apples to apples comparison? Uh, three, what is the evaluation criteria? And what is the evaluation plan above and beyond that, right? What are the different steps? How are we making your decision? Uh, are we working through a short list? And, and what are the different options that we're building in for ourselves on the, um, on the project that we're putting out to the market? Uh, the fourth is the contract format. So how do we bring everything together? Uh, and then the fifth one is what is the tendering format, which is a, a bit of you know, Canadian slash UK uh, procurement jargon. So what, what's the bid format, right? Are we, is it a formal bid? Is it an RFP? Is it a, is it a, you know, are we gonna do a request for information first and move into an RFP? Uh, just what is the vehicle that we're actually gonna use to, to go through uh, the project? Uh, and the reality is you know, all these components and elements are, are highly critical. Um, but a lot of these questions are missed when procurement managers are rushed to complete projects, especially with, you know, there, there's obstacles on inefficiency, inefficiencies and things of like that in your nature. So um, just thinking about variables like timing, you know, we hear about this all the time from different procurement teams where they're often working with multiple internal customers. It's going to be tough to connect and schedule meetings to gather those requirements and to get the approvals that you need. So to keep projects running on time, you might rush the collaborative or, or you might rush some of the information gathering steps. Um, because there's just too much time on the front end to actually get everything that you need. And sometimes teams need to bias towards uh, just getting things done. 
Uh, sometimes even just the space between the geography between different stakeholders might, might cause complications, right? Uh, we might be working with a third party who's helping us develop the scope, or we might be working with some stakeholders who might be in a different location than us. Um, even that just makes it difficult to actually have that collaborative environment if, if we're in different, again, geographic locations. Even something as simple as a different building, right? It might be in the same city, but um, how are we going to, you know, meet and, and get this all figured out? Uh, you know, geographic barriers might be okay if you had really strong digital tools to support some of that communication, but a lot of agencies don't. Um, and I think even just communication is a, kind of as a subset of the geography problem, or, or maybe is the overlying issue. It's just sometimes it's just hard to keep everyone on the same page and, and make sure that we're all um, communicating effectively and that we're expectations are set clearly about what information we need or, or the format that we need information in by. Um, of course, manual processes add a lot of stress to this, you know, to the understanding and the collection of these five different requirements. If information's coming in through an email or if information is being blurted out at you while you're you know, refilling your water, uh, it's gonna be difficult to think about, well, how do I collect, aggregate that information and make sure that I'm considering all these factors when I go ahead and actually launch this project. Um, and really as a result of all these different stress points when considering all these different, um, all these different questions, a, a lot of this results in, you know, like rogue spending, right? Where end users or departments are gonna try to find ways to subvert procurement and, and just go directly to market themselves. Um, which of course is what none of us want. Um, so again, you know, th this is just some factors that I think procurement teams should be thinking of. Of course, the question still remains, um, how can procurement managers actually streamline that RFP creation process uh, while ensuring the 95-5? Well, making sure that we're answering these questions and making sure that we're working collaboratively with the, with the stakeholders who we need to have involved. So that moves us into the next component of the presentation here, uh, which is understanding these three stages of RFP creation. Um, and as you can see in this visual wheel, the, the three components are requirement definition, uh, research, and build. And the text here is pretty tiny, even, even small for me. So don't worry, we'll, we'll be zooming in on this and, and diving into these a bit more. Um, but these are really the three components of how you can go about creating an RFP. Uh, you know, the requirement stage cap encapsulates all the steps that procurement managers take to, of course, gather the requirements of that project from their stakeholders. Um, you know, this might start off as an internal request from a stakeholder or from an end user who wants to purchase a good or service. Uh, they may notify you of that request through a phone call, a meeting, or, you know, forwarding an email chain to you. Uh, you also might field potential assessment criteria from the requesting stakeholder at this point in time as well. From there, that flows into... Uh, the research phase. Uh, and of course, if it's, a, if it's an RFP for something that might be unfamiliar, uh, you might consult neighboring agencies or, or search Google for different templates, but we need to understand, yeah, the customer gave us all this information. Are they giving us the full story? And, and what do I wanna pull in that's objective to help maybe ground the project or uh, that might help me live in a bit more of the reality of what, what type of market or what the services might look like in, in, that, in that market. Uh, and then of course, finally, there's the build process uh, for the RFPs. Uh, which is really where the rubber hits the road and you can pull all the information together to create the RFP itself and get it ready to go out for solicitations. And I mean, the reality is each of these stages present opportunities in which, uh, you know, you can minimize back and forth communications, increase collaboration and, and automate processes, uh, ultimately leading to a more efficient and, and streamlined process. So we'll, we'll go ahead and dig into how we can streamline each stage of that process. Um, I do see some questions coming in here. Uh, Will slides be made available for the presentation for future use? Uh, I believe yes. And I'll go ahead and send that off. Okay. Let's hop into the first component here, which is streamlining the requirement stage. So I, I think it's worth noting first and foremost, uh, when it comes to how we get information here, I think for a lot of teams, one of the difficulties is that there's a lot of different information that comes in in a lot of different ways. So I think thinking about ways that you can standardize the way that information comes in is critical. And of course, um, you know, most teams have a process that is somewhat standardized, but the problem is, is there's so many different customers who are requesting so many different things. Uh, I think it's really valuable to, you know, work with your different customer departments or whatever departments you, you leverage the most and actually you know, understand what type of information that you need from them and create like a more general template. 
Uh, the also nice thing is if, if you actually work with the end users to define what that template looks like, it's going to ensure that you have some higher adoption of that template as well. Um, but just, just creating a resource that your end users actually want to use is, is oftentimes uh, one of the trickiest parts. Because if we were, again, if, no one, if we build a template and no one uses it, then it's not going to provide us much value. Um, of course, you know, creating customizable stakeholder project request forms and uh, you know, intake processes through some type of technology could help create a more centralized uh, portal or a more centralized repository of you know, everything that you want to see as well from, from one centralized location. Uh, in contrast to what a lot of teams do, which is managing this through email or managing this through different forms, or uh, you know, sometimes people just come by and stop by your desk and say, hey, we want to get this done. Um, it's, it's just hard to organize all that information. And because it's hard to organize that information, it's, it's hard to have visibility. Um, so I, I guess if you were to break this down a bit more, it's like having that standardized template to receive information, um, thinking about a way where you can organize the information that we've received, and then also thinking about a way where we can manage and triage the process of the information we received as we move through the next following stages are, are some of the key things to consider uh, in the requirements collection component of the, of the process. Um, above and beyond that, thinking about, you know, if, if you are using any type of like e-procurement software or anything of that nature, that data that we're collecting on that intake process, how is that actually being going to be pushed into that system? Uh, so is there a way where we can think about, uh, you know, flowing the information from that, that we're collecting from those customers into the actual event that we're going to be running? That's definitely something that's, uh, you know, worth thinking about, uh, thinking about how, you know, of the different stages of how I collect data and move that data through the process, where are there manual processes that exist and how through potentially through technology or through a process that I can develop, can I remove some of those manual processes to save me uh, a lot of time? And, and again, grant some of our internal customers more visibility into the process that's actually happening. Um, of course, if you can create a system that can facilitate the collection of that information, the standardization of that information, and then the assignment, of those tasks against some of your stakeholders. Uh, that's what's, you know, that, that's kind of what we see teams strive towards to be the ideal state. Uh, in that case, you'd be able to, you know, understand and organize your team's workload and, and triage everything accordingly. Uh, and when your team comes together to plan, it's, it's gonna be a lot more faster and a lot more efficient to review new and open requests, uh, update details and assignments, and, and make sure that you hit those deadlines. Um, the other thing that I also like to think about, and, and we see this be successful for a lot of procurement teams that we're working with is, you know, defining what the milestones of what the requirements gathering stage looks like and ensuring that we're sending out communication to the internal customer as we move through some of those different milestones. Again, that, that almost just comes from this, this idea of process standardization. And again, making sure that we can hold our customers accountable to what that process looks like and also make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable to, to it as well. Uh, again, defining the process and no one following it doesn't, doesn't really do anything for anyone. Um, some of the things that we see uh, teams gain a lot of benefit from are you know, streamlining the requirement stage by automating uh, you know, request notifications and project status updates. Uh, those can eliminate the all too common death by a million cuts that, that procurement manager experience, uh, where so much of their time is spent giving stakeholders updates on you know, project statuses or uh, answering stakeholder questions. So setting up a way to automate some of these notifications to alert stakeholders and evaluators of project status changes or things of that nature can really free up the time for procurement teams to, to focus on what matters most. Um, we see some teams who try to manage this through an Excel sheet. Uh, of course, you know that, that's a strong option and, and looking at purpose-built tools for this is uh, something that we, of course, recommend taking a look at as well, but just having some type of a dashboard for all your information to live in, right? Uh, to collect those requests as they come in and ensure that nothing's falling through the cracks and that we're, we're staying on top of all the actions that we need to as we work with these customers. Uh, all the better if it's a dashboard or if it's a resource that you can share with those internal customers so they can understand where their projects are as well. Um, you know, that, that centralized location is, is really critical and it just allows uh, so that you can quickly and easily communicate information back to suppliers um, while everyone can you know, kind of keep up with their day jobs. Um, the clarity and assurance that none of those details are, are falling through the cracks, that, that's what really is gonna help remove any barriers and, and make it easy for your agency to, um, or for the, for the customers to engage with the procurement uh, earlier on. I'm going ahead and just take a look at some of these uh, questions here. 
Um, the first one, or maybe not the first one, but the first one that I can see is what would you say the brunt of the requirements are? Uh, is it 50-50 with procurement and end user? And, and, and uh, Mike, this is your question here, but are you specifically talking about like who the onus falls on to actually define those requirements, whether it's all coming from the end user or, or from procurement? Is, is, am I understanding that correct? Correct, okay. Uh, the way that I always like to think about it and what we've seen work really well is the customers are the ones who are the ones, you know, they're the, the market experts. Uh, they understand what is out there the most. And of course they understand the project that they're looking to accomplish the most. So I would say that it's the end user that is responsible for developing most of those requirements. But I think the role that procurement plays, uh, which is an important one is we still need to do our due diligence and do our research to make sure that the project, if we were to go forward those requirements, is this a fair process that we're putting out to the market? Is this actually representative of, um, you know, uh, what the market can offer, or is this really pre-baked to because we have someone in mind, even though they might not be the best solution for our organization? Um, so I think all those requirements more so come from the internal customer in an ideal world, but procurement's playing the role to actually, you know, see how other organizations have ran these events. Uh, procurement's playing the role to understand that, hey, like, you know, you, the scope of requirements that you're putting out here, it, this doesn't really feel like it's representative of, you know, what other agencies are doing. And, and honestly, what we typically see it is it is a lot through checking with other agencies and understanding what other agencies are asking for. It's kind of one of the fastest ways or the least, at least one of the least time intensive ways and least, least, least resource intensive ways to validate that, yeah, the project that we're putting out to the market is consistent with what other agencies have done, um, which we can at least infer from that. It's consistent with, you know, is something that is, uh, you know, representative of what is out in the market and is fair to the market as well. Great. I, uh, there's some good comments in here as well. They're, they're not necessarily questions, but there's some good tips and tricks. Um, they're used to sharing, sharing something about the RFP template that they created about standardizing the three sections. So really boiling it down to simple terms, which I think is a really good idea. Scope of work, evaluation criteria, and proposal requirements that need to be changed for each RFP. So of course, that means you don't have to worry about fixing all the, the terms and conditions or anything like that. We can standardize a lot of that language. And again, just focus the internal customers on, yeah, the, these are the three things that I need you to dive into more. So that's a, that's a great comment. We'll go over to the next section or the next component of that in just one moment. We're going to get back to another live poll here. Uh, and the question is, or the statement rather is, collaborating with stakeholders during the RFP process is a challenge for our team. And I can be anywhere from, I strongly agree with that statement, which means that I do think that this is a challenge or I can strongly disagree where uh, I don't think the collaboration with stakeholders is a challenge at all. So we'll throw up some time here and uh, go ahead and uh, participate on these live polls. I also would encourage folks to type in what you've seen work for, for your agencies in the chat too, right? I mean, I think bottom line is we're all here to learn and hopefully we're bringing some perspective to the table, but of course, um, a lot of you folks have good practices that work as well. So continue to do that uh, if you're not too shy. And Anthony, here are results. Okay. So, 14% of people said that they strongly agree that that collaboration is, uh, is a challenge when it comes to uh, bringing together the elements of that project. 45%, which is by and large the, the, the largest uh, or the highest responded category, said that they do agree with that, just not a strong agree. 21% um, are neural, neutral, 19% disagree. Interestingly, no one, zero uh, people strongly disagree, but that's, that's fine. Um, I think <clears throat> what, what I pull from this, and, and this is something that we see all the time, um, you know, procurement in the nature that, of the work that, that we're doing, it is a highly, highly collaborative role where we're so dependent on so many other inputs from so many other stakeholders, uh, whether it's of course the internal customers or, or evaluators or even, even suppliers and vendors, right? Um, and that's because of the, all the communication that's happening that makes it really difficult. And because of the tools, which often don't facilitate that communication, you know, when that communication is happening through email or through phone calls or through whatever, 
the communication is fine, but it's just the, the record of keeping, or sorry, it's keeping record and keeping track of all the communication, which often gets difficult. And without having that in one sort of centralized place, that, that's where we see uh, some friction points typically come up. Um, but we'll go ahead and hop over to the next section here, which is uh, streamlining the research phase. And we've already dabbled into this just a bit here, or, or talking about uh, some of the research. Because um, of course, uh, you know, research comes after requirements, right? So how are we validating that? And uh, how else are we understanding how other agencies did that? Um, but you know, uh, bottom line here is procurement teams are getting requests for basically anything, right? I mean, potholes, patching to software to PPE, what, you, know, you name it, right? You, you're probably getting a request for something. Um, Templates, uh, like what was mentioned in chat, uh, can help you structure some unfamiliar RFPs faster. So what we see a lot of teams do, and uh, we see teams actually compile their own library of RFP, temp RFP templates specifically for their internal team, uh, which is designed to help you leverage previously used RFP documents as well as templates from neighboring agencies. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel if we don't need to, right? What, what can we use that we've leveraged that from work that we've done in the past? And what work that other agencies have done can be leveraged also to kind of expedite, um, you know, the research phase and make sure that again what we're putting out and the requirements that we have are realistic and again representative of what's up in the market. Um, however, what we typically see the risk with some of these libraries is that they do require a lot of legwork to maintain uh, and keep everything up to date. So organizations that don't frequently update their template library. I uh, do risk accidentally creating RFPs with, you know, let's say irrelevant questions or with out of date terms or things that might not be there with the latest and greatest. And of course, that could be frustrating or, or discouraging for vendors. So, um, you know, a very common thing that even we see on RFPs that, that we respond to, right, is if there's a requirement for something like a fax number, well, maybe you might want to fax us, but it, it just shows that that template probably hasn't been updated in a while. Um, and sorry, I don't, I don't mean to give you uh, any personal offense if any organizations are. Uh, still active faxers out there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just, you know, something that just shows that the template might be a bit dated. Um, of course, a sustainable option for procurement teams is to source, you know, RFE samples and templates uh, from easy to navigate RFE catalogs, uh, you know, catalogs that compile things that have historical projects and, and newer trending projects uh, from public sector teams all across, you know, state and local governments uh, throughout North America. Uh, you know, something like that would, of course, be beneficial to not just see historical projects again, but see, hey, what are what do projects have, or what other projects do teams have on the market right now uh, that might be relevant to the project that I'm putting up here. Uh, so in tandem with those templates, procurement teams can take a data-driven approach to RFP research by, you know, accessing RFP industry benchmarks from uh, tens of thousands of solicitations, which can you can use to help effectively structure your RFP and, and shorten your RFP research time. Um, you know, there's a, a few different sources of these type of data out there, but, you know, imagine a world where you could take a look at a library and understand, hey, you know, for the average RFP timeline for a specific category, uh, which will, of course, help for understanding what how much resources we're going to have to need to invest, time resources into this project, but also setting proper expectations for that internal customer about, uh, you know, what we see other agencies do uh, en masse. Um, even things like looking at, you know, how, what other evaluation criteria are other teams using or things of that nature, all that can be configured and, and accessed through some of these data sources as well. Um, and of course, that would help you, you know, make sure that we're putting a, a document out that's representative of, of what we want to buy in the best way possible and uh, potentially even limit any, you know, the, the future issuance of addenda if there's any type of corrections or, or things like that that to happen. Uh, of course, there are a lot of e-procurement solutions out there that have aggregated data from projects run through the system, um, you know, providing significant sample sizes when consolidated with industry benchmarks on things like, you know, average criteria weighting, timelines, and project structure. So uh, the data is especially useful when you're facing, a, again, those new or unfamiliar, unfamiliar projects where, where benchmarks can give you the wisdom of the masses and, you know, enable your organization to knowledgeably tackle any different request. Um, it also helps just level set expectations with stakeholders that I mentioned, just making sure that everyone's on the same page and everyone understands, you know, compared to the industry, this is how long this type of RFP would typically take. I'm just going to take a look at some of these chat messages that are coming in here as well, um, just to give some volume to some of the voices. 
So Stacy mentioned that she finds it really beneficial to involve all parties to the table, uh, the end user, AP management, and anyone else who the project will impact. Uh, so typically starts with a kickoff meeting to brainstorm and to find out what works and what doesn't work. I think that's a great idea, right? Just having that level set of bringing all the stakeholders together. I also do think that um, bringing in the different perspectives of, of stake, stakeholders who might impact, that also helps with the research phase. It just makes sure that, again, procurement won't be too heavily indexing on this, the, the version of the story that this one end user has, has decided to tell us, right? It just maybe some other stakeholders or surrounding auxiliary departments might have additional perspective they can provide, and that might help round out, you know, the, the project requirements or, you know, the project scope that we're, that we're planning to go to market out with. Um, so great. Yeah, great point, Stacey. Uh, Catherine mentioned that the biggest issue with collaboration uh, is the end user being too defensive to feedback uh, and knowing what they want already. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, for, for what it's worth, I, I feel like that is very much a, not a novel thing. Uh, and we hear about public procurement all the time dealing with that as an issue. And I, and I think um, it's especially a challenge again, where it's just like, I know what I want already. Let's just do this procurement, stop getting in my way and let me do what I want to do. Um, and it can sometimes be an uncomfortable role to play, but I, I think that's when it comes to leveraging what other agencies have done, where it's not just, you know, it's not just me as the procurement person pushing back on what you're doing is, uh, you know, the customer who wants to buy this thing. It's, I want to bring the perspective of what other agencies have done. And I want to make sure we're making the best decision for our county, our city, our district, whatever it might be. Right. Um, so I, uh, what we see a lot of teams do really successfully is versus like setting this up where you're pushing back against your customer by adding value and bringing the perspective of what other agencies have done, it could help soften that conversation. So, um, but again, that's of course, uh, putting you in a position where you're leaning on these other agencies, but we have seen that again, just make it an easier conversation to have where, Hey, this agency in our state or this agency who is a similar size city down the, across the country, even they ran it this way. And I think they have some interesting things. Can we talk about this? Um, maybe something that might help. And then Amanda validated that, yeah, she experienced that too. So, so maybe that as a suggestion might help, but again, it's just re use, thinking about research and data and leveraging what other agencies have done is a way to kind of bolster your position where again, it's not just about you pushing back against the customer. It's about you making sure the customer is going up to the market with all the facts and all the knowledge. And you know, they, they might know everything, but I'm sure there's perspective that can be added from some of these other, da other data sources, whether we're finding things in that RFP sample database or, or whether we're finding them on Google. But um, to me, that's, that's what I think the critical part of the research is, is just making sure that we can yeah, you know, that we're not leaving the, the customer free reign by defining and running this project, whatever they want that we're actually, again, creating that scope. So let's dive into the third thing here, uh, the third component, which is the build phase. Uh, as you can see, there's the most components of the build phase on here. Uh, this is really where the rubber hits the road. And this is where we're going to actually uh, do the work, right? We're having those active discussions. We have some agreements on the initial scope and we start slotting different components into the actual document. So uh, there's a few things to keep in mind here as well. Um, of course, there's a lot of tools that exist out on the market, you know, collaborative tools like for RFP editing and uh, real-time messaging and in-app approvals that help make the process smooth for everyone. Again, this is, this is kind of like uh, the idea that I've been talking about earlier, you know, by, by bringing everyone into a digital working space it just makes sure that everyone's on the same page and, and it just makes sure that nothing is falling through the cracks and that we're keeping each other accountable. Um, you know, other things to consider are like the efficiency of your approval process at this part of the workflow is, is critical. Um, there's a lot of different stakeholders who are involved in, of course, collaborating on this. There's also more than likely a few stakeholders who are involved on in giving us, you know, the old rubber stamp before we, we have to go out to the market. So thinking about how you can keep people on top of, on top of that. Uh, there are a lot of tools with dedicated reminders and, and uh, you know, ways to make sure that nothing like that falls through the cracks. Um, you know, if you're, if you're looking for ways to streamline your RFP approval process uh, in a way that also facilitates improved collaboration and transparency, uh, there's a few solutions to keep in mind. So, um, you know, you can focus your time on more high value work with those automated reminders, like I mentioned, uh, creating efficiency and reducing room for error with shared file clause libraries and templates. Again, viewing all past, current, and, and upcoming approvals in one place. So having that line of sight to see what needs to be uh, completed. Satisfying compliance requirements with advanced analytics and, and reporting. 
and then maintaining document version control. So you don't, you know, accidentally send out outdated documents or outdated, um, you know, components of documents for to, out to approvers. Um, this was mentioned earlier by, by someone in the chat again, but when, you know, when you're starting to create that RFP, using predefined templates is a way to save teams a significant amount of time in the early stages of that RFP creation. Um, you know, instead of starting with that blank document and, and filling in the details manually, which uh, you know, always adds the additional risk of human error, uh, RFP templates are, are simple, they're easy to use. You know, they, you can pre-populate new projects and uh, fill up you know, fields or different components of whatever you need. Uh, to standardize the way that you run your project categories and, and you know, facilitate the way that you have to meet those team needs. Uh, of course, you know, lots of teams have a library of templates and uh, Google Drives and things like that. And, and I think those are good solutions. Um, the, the next step is, you know, if you think about how an e-procurement e -procurement system might allow you to facilitate the, the sharing of those templates, that could allow you to create, you know, deeper categorization and, and a little bit more automation in terms of how those templates can be linked up to a specific type of project that we're, that we're pushing out to the market. Um, you know, and of course, these templates will allow you to standardize everything across your team, uh, increase your team's efficiency, and, and make sure that the process that we're using is more repeatable uh, and, and really compliant. Uh, when it comes to actually creating, you know, the RFP itself, that, that's also something that we're seeing more and more teams look towards facilitating in an actual technology solution. Um, this keeps one of the most labor intensive processes within a tool designed for procurement teams and, you know, making sure that the whole process is transparent and, and audible and, and again, standardized across teams. Um, e even teams who are using things like Google, you know, a Google sheet or anything that's a bit more collaborative in nature, it just allows everyone to be working on one living document versus sharing one document back and forth, right? Where it's, you know, I have version 1.012 and I send that back and 10 versions later, we we have some weird Frankenstein that we don't really understand how we got here. Um, having that living document, uh, we've seen that be a really big uh, difference maker for teams when it comes to, again, uh, working on the dynamic or working on the variable parts of that RFP, right? Uh, again, if we're in a position where we have a strong library of templates, where most of the RFP document is templated out, we can focus our efforts on, on working on and uh, working collaboratively on the elements that need to be changed. And thinking about what tools we have to actually support those that, that quick back and forth and support uh, proper version control of what needs to be changed is, is something to think about for sure. Um, the other nice thing about some of the more sophisticated tools is that you have a little bit more control in terms of understanding which of your stakeholders can do certain things, right? I mean, um, you don't want everyone to be able to come in and make all the changes and, and change components of the document that shouldn't be changed. So. Uh, you know, use your role-based access and, and access control. So those, those are all things to think about as well when it comes to how we can actually uh, create the RFPs uh, using like a, a technology piece or, or something like that. Um, both approval workflows and RFP editing can be made more efficient with features that are actually built into an e-procurement system that are designed to promote collaboration. Uh, you know, these could be anything from uh, internal messaging, which enables buyers, stakeholders, and, and evaluators to keep all, all RFP-related discussions within the e-procurement platform, uh, providing that source of truth location for all feedback and decision-making, uh, and features that are designed for sending and reviewing documents within your e-procurement system to you know, facilitate faster reviews and approvals and ensuring, uh, again, proper version control and eliminating the need to, to tie in any other digital systems. Um, all that to say is I, I think the bottom line that, that I'd recommend from here is, uh, as we mentioned uh, already in, in chat earlier, thinking about how you can standardize the components of your RFP or bid document, things that we never need to change. Thinking about how we can expose that to those the collaborators, those SMEs, those, those end users, whoever they might be. And again, having a system that can actually facilitate a, a collaborative changing of those core components um, through a platform. Again, there's a lot of options out there for, for one that's, you know, no cost. You can think about, uh, you know, something like a Google document where you can get everyone involved. Of course, you know, some of those options are, are feature limited as well. And, and there's, there's a few other options out there that, um, you know, would be cost, but uh, anyway, that, that's kind of wraps up everything I want to say on the building phase of this. Uh, moving forth to the next component, you know, outcomes beyond efficiency. So when you streamline your RFP creation process, you know, keeping in mind both the 95-5 rule and thinking about ways that you can increase efficiency through those three stages of the RFP creation, uh, the results really do go beyond just efficiency. Um, so the first one here is overall 
project cost savings. Um, so based on client supply data on spending for the same project before adopting a best agreed e-procurement tool, uh, we see agencies are typically able to save 9.1% on each individual project. So uh, that represents an average value of $112,000 across uh, really all project categories that, that we see. Um, of course, these cost savings result, um, you know, they're resulting from using RFP requirements that are sourced from industry best practices, um, vetting what your customers are sending to you and, and ensuring that we're putting something out to the market that is fair and, and representative of what actually exists out in the market and ensuring that when we do push back on stakeholders that they have the ability to communicate with us and collaborate with us. So it's not, it doesn't feel like we're cutting them out. Um, all that are, you know, critical components to building the best document that we can or the best vehicle that we can, which is gonna make sure that we can make the best decision down the line as well. Um, by just having a really clear understanding of what those requirements are. Uh, increased vendor participation is, is the second one on here. So uh, vendors are much more likely to bid on properly structured RFPs with clear requirements and project scope, uh, which of course will allow for you know, higher vendor engagement, which increases competition and ensures a better project outcome. Um, we saw a lot of teams who save on an average of 6% on overall project costs. Uh, and that's just by virtue of receiving more submissions. So if you were able to get three additional submissions on a project that would otherwise only get one, or for two, uh, you know, we typically see teams save about 6% on that. Um, I get as an agency who responds to these RPs as well. I mean, you know, we've, when things are more highly structured, it just allows us to, you know, if you definitely building in something like a checklist on your RFP, uh, even though it seems like a really simple thing, it just ensures that vendors understand everything that they need to be submitting so that you're not going to get any non-responsive submissions. So it just makes sure that when you are able to cast a net and you're able to get a vendor to participate, um, by structuring that document in the right way, it's going to make sure that it's very clear what the expectations are to those vendors, which again will uh, allow for less eliminations due to non-responsiveness. Uh, we have return on investment here is uh, the third tab. Uh, so when e-procurement users are asked directly about the ROI for some procurement systems, uh, the response is clear. 85% of procurement teams believe their e-procurement system has delivered a large return on investment uh, in their, to their desired benefits. And the last one we have on here is compliance. Um, so shortcuts in your RFP creation process can lead to uncompetitive practices, uh, a lack of tr transparency, and reduce value for money. So best of breed procurement issues ensures that the proper transparency and audit trails that support a compliant process, um, you, you can I'll accomplish all those while still remaining nimble and uh, efficient. Which leads us into this final visual here. Um, and, and this to me, it just, it's, it's, uh, you know, if, if anyone's heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's, it's not exactly as clean of a triangle, uh, as Maslow's, but, um, it kind of looks more like a, a house here, but we can kind of see the way that we think about this, right? There's, there's this best of breed e-procurement system here, which is on the bottom, which, which has all these different tools and all these different capabilities that, that we've alluded to, but what that enables as you move your way up is, uh, being able to facilitate all of these, the different collaboration components, uh, which can be supported by technology, by housing all your communication, by standardizing your templates, by ensuring that the um, configurations of that project happen in a system that allows you to track all those changes, which enables you to have a stronger sense of transparency and compliance, um, which, you know, of course, because we can see all those changes, they're all captured in the system. And because everything's captured in the system as well, that, that leads to efficiency, which ultimately leads to the best value outcome as well. Um, you know, at the foundation of all these practices, as we've mentioned briefly in this presentation, is, is that best of breed e-procurement system. Um, you know, there, there's options out there, of course, uh, and, and for what it's worth, we do have um, a lot of these principles that are designed in, um, in our latest white paper, which is the Procurement Manager's Guide to Rapid RFP Creation. So uh, feel free to check that out if you want to uh, dive deeper into that. There's some information that I covered today that's in that document as well, but of course it goes into much deeper detail since um, it's, it's a big long form PDF instead of uh, you know, me talking for 50 minutes. And if you do want to check that out, I'll, you know, this is what it looks like here. Um, it is coming to your inbox, so I, I guess we're sending you all a copy uh, so you can take a look at it right there right away. Um, yeah, that, that does move us to the end of the presentation here. Um, so we still do have 10 minutes or so, or, or just about 10 minutes to take on any questions that you might have. So 
feel free to type those in the chat or into Q and A, and and I'm I'm going to take a look at some of these comments that are in here, and I can share those with the with the group at large. Yeah, th this is a. Uh, Hopefully I'm saying your name right. It's, I'm saying Therese, but it might be Teresa. But um, I think this is a really interesting comment and, and I'm just gonna read it verbatim. Uh, so subject matter experts that are not part of the end user organization can help when the departments want what they want only. Uh, the neutral partner that knows the current industry standards is often a great way to break that pattern is the most departments are not up to date on most technology or services available, but only what they have used in the past. Um, and that's something that we see a lot as well. And, and I think that's just a really succinct way to, to talk about the idea that I was mentioning before, right? Um, everyone has inherent biases in here. Uh, sorry, in here. Well, yeah, everyone has biases in here, uh, whether we like to admit it or not. And then for the customers that the folks in here are servicing, they, they often have biases as well. And, and those biases could be rooted on what they've used in the past. So just thinking about how we can get in an objective source of information or an additional source of information to break, to break that pattern, I think uh, is critical. Um, and I think this is a, this is a great way thing to consider as well. So, so thanks for sharing. Keeping an eye for any other questions or comments or anything else, um, feel free to, to type them out. Okay. What was the name of the document that we'll be um, receiving via email? So let me go, uh, let me see if I can go backwards here in my slides. So that name of the document is the Procurement Manager's Guide to Rapid RFP Creation. Um, so you can go ahead and take a look at that. Keep, keep an eye open for there. Just reading through chat here. Uh, for any information on Bonfire, you can Google Bonfire Procurement and, and you can find us out. Um, and in fact, we can probably have someone connect with you guys if, if that's something that you're interested in. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I mean, I've, I've, there's not many questions coming in. There's a lot of thank yous coming in. So thank thank you for joining. I thank you to everyone who shared too. Again, our goal is to, again, share knowledge and best practices, and we can bring some of those to the table. But of course, for folks who are commenting in chat, that, that's great. So uh, thanks for your participation. Uh, definitely makes a big difference. Uh, as we wrap up here, Justin, I think you had some notes that you wanted to uh, round up on. Yes, thank you, Anthony, and our audience for their participation. Uh, please take time to fill out the evaluation survey. Once we end, uh, you'll receive a prompt to take that. Both the recording and survey links will also be emailed to you later this afternoon. Uh, thanks again, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Take care.